Chapter 17 By All That's Holy There's a back alley between the tenement buildings. You can't see it from the road. And Niggy takes us along the alley to this other place. You can tell the door's been busted in and the lock broke. And we go into the dark hallway. The lights come on and the first thing I notice is the, perf- the perfume an old lady wears and the smell of cats. This ain't that much, but the old bat that lives here took the greyhound to visit her sister for the holidays. Iggy says he's trying to smile. The little room is warm and close feeling, and the furniture is real old and saggy. There's a big old TV with a doily on the top, and an empty goldfish bowl, and piles of newspapers tied up neat with string, and a Bible on this little table by the TV. Also, there's this trick picture of Jesus on the wall, where his eyes keep following you. And you go cross-eyed looking at it. Ain't much worth, ain't much worth taking, Iggy says. My father is looking around, making sure the curtains are closed. You think I'd steal from an old woman? He says. Iggy shakes his head. I sure don't. Never you mind, my father says. This will do in a pinch, until we get started. I I better get back to Loretta. You do that. My father watches the door shut behind Iggy. And he doesn't say anything. I'm just standing there in the middle of the room because I don't know what he wants me to do. Make yourself comfy, boy. He finally says, I'm going to check if we have a back way out. I'm looking at the door we just came in by. Just looking. When all of a sudden he's there behind me, and I feel the cool air of him on the back of my neck. You wouldn't light out on me now, would you? No, sir, I wouldn't. Sit down, he says. We need to talk, man to man. I sit down in this old lady's chair that's so soft, I almost sink through to the floor. And I'm wondering what's happened to the cats. Maybe she took them with her to visit her sister. Or maybe Iggy let them out, and they can't get back in. He leans over me and puts his big hands on the arms of the chair and says, Now, your grandparents say you're nothing but a dysfunctional idiot, but no kin of mine is an idiot, and that's a fact. So first things, you got to start acting smart. Use your head. We've got a situation going here, boy, so the way to handle it, you just do exactly what I say, no matter what. Understood? Yes, sir. His hand shoves through my hair, and I can feel how strong he is, even though he doesn't hurt me. That's good, he says. That's real good. He goes into the other room, and I can hear a door banging and stuff being moved around, and when he comes back... He's got this rope in his hands. A boy who doesn't know his own father might be dumb enough to run away, he says. We can't have that, can we? No, sir. No, sir, what? No, sir, we can't have that. What he does is tie up my feet and my hands and then loops the ends of the rope around his waist. I'm taking sack time while I can, he says. You're as smart as I think you are. You'll get some shut-eye, too. He turns out the lights and lies down on the floor beside the chair, with just his arm for a pillow. And for a long time, I can't tell whether he's asleep or pretending. Then I decide it doesn't matter. If I move, the rope will surely wake him. It seems like we're frozen inside that room, even though the air is warm and stuffy. The soft chair keeps a hold of me. I'm not strong enough to get up. My feet and hands are getting tingly where they're tied. And pretty soon, I can't even keep my eyes open. I'm half asleep, dreaming a cat is in the other room, meowing for milk. And I'm still thinking about that cat when something tugs me. He's sitting there in the dark, and I can't see his face. And he says, Wake up, sleepyhead. I better tell my son a thing or two he needs to know about his own father. First, like I already said, I never killed anybody. I'm big like you're big. So so folks assume things they shouldn't. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir, I do. Good. Now the other thing is the geezers you've been living with all these years. I bet they never gave you the presents I sent you, did they? No, sir, 
They didn't. He shakes his head real sorrowful. That's a crime. Not giving a boy presents from his father. I suppose you didn't get the letters I sent. No, no. If they didn't give over the presents, they likely tore up the letters. Another crime against humanity. That's what that is. They hated me from first sight on account of my appearance and because I wasn't good enough for their precious daughter. As if a man should be blamed for how fearsome or cruel he looks when in fact he's truly a loving person inside, which I am. I can hardly see a sad movie without crying, and I'm not afraid to say so. There's just enough streetlight coming through the curtains so I can make out part of his face when he turns it. You can see where there's a wet spot on his cheek, and he brushes it away. I've been locked up like an animal, he says. Every single night, I cry myself to sleep, and that's a fact. Killer Kane, that's just an unkind nickname they hung on me. You know how kids can be mean in school, mean as animals? It was like that. Only these weren't kids. They were adults who should know better, except they're so ignorant and hateful they believe the worst. His voice was sort of ragged, but you can't help but listen to him. You follow the words up and down, like you're riding through mountains, and you can't see the other side. All you can do is just see the road ahead. A great injustice was done to me, boy. He says, what those people did, they stole my life. They took years away from me. Or might as well cut out my heart with a knife. That's how it was to lie awake each night and think about the injustice that was done to me. They'd blame me for all the wrongs in the world. Those people, by which I mean the geezers, her folks, they always hated me. And of course, the police who failed to see the truth of the situation. He stops to rub away another stream of tears. There's no crying in his voice. You can't hear it there. But sure enough, the tears are all over his face, slick and shiny in the pale, pale light. I woke up just now, worrying that you might wonder why I never did mention her, your mother. You might still be thinking the wrong way on that and believe what they told you. You being such a tiny little thing, what happened? How could you know the truth of it? He gets up then. And he goes over by the TV set, far enough so the rope is tugging at me. And then he's back, and he's got a book in his hand. You know what this is, boy? The Bible, I say. You can tell that in the dark, can't you? That's fine. What I'm going to do, I'm going to put my right hand down on this Bible, see? Yes, sir, I see. And I'm putting my other hand over my heart. Can you see that? Yes, sir, I can. That's a good boy. Now, listen up. I, Kenneth David Kane, do swear on all that's holy that I did not murder this boy's mother. And if that isn't the truth, may God strike me dead. I'm waiting to see if something happens. And nothing does. The room is the same. It smells of old lady perfume and missing cats. And my hands and feet are still tied by the rope to his waist. Satisfied? I want to answer him. My throat closes up and my tongue is so dry, I can't hardly open my mouth. I keep thinking about how his, how heavy his hand was on that Bible. I asked you a question, boy. Yes, sir, I say. I'm satisfied. He lies back down after that, and pretty soon he's breathing heavy again. I can't sleep, though. I just sit there like a lump till the sun comes up, trying not to think about things I don't want to remember.